what I would like to do is give a fair assessment of what went on at Waterloo and also the quality of these troops. And there are, so there are a few side, if, uh, side things I came across while in, uh, going through this, and hopefully it will all interest you as we go along. Now, what I will start with is just talking about the um, actual movement of the troops um, on the, this is actually the 16th of June. Uh, although we know Napoleon crosses the border of Chalwa around about the 15th of June, um, in fact, obviously, the troops, uh, 52nd, etc., were in the 2nd Division under uh, Lieutenant General uh, Clinton, Henry Clinton, were, were miles out at Ath and beyond, which is actually a good 50 to 60 miles away from Brussels. Now, this meant that they had absolutely no idea on the 15th that the invasion had actually started. And in fact, it was actually on the 16th that uh, the 52nd is where I've actually indicated here with the, with the marker. Uh, we're actually up at five o'clock in the morning, ready to actually have a field practice day at Quever Camp, which is uh, just on the road from there, with the rest of the brigade. Um, so there was absolutely no thought that they were going to be involved in any form of fighting at this stage. And this is actually on the 16th of June, the day of the Battle of Capture Bra. At around about seven o'clock, Henry Clinton at Ath receives the first message from Wellington that was sent the previous evening at about seven o'clock, uh, saying that uh, the troops should form at Ath immediately. So uh, he actually orders his division to actually form up at Ath. Uh, it's nearer 10 o'clock before the message for the troops to actually move actually gets to these troops uh, out in the field here. And it's nearer two o'clock before the 52nd and the rest of the brigade actually arrive at Ath, which is only about seven miles away. So although they were previously ordered at around seven o'clock in the morning, it took that long. Why did it take that long? Because the 95th were at Mons all the way down here. They had to come up and join them all at Ath before they could move on. Uh, at one o'clock, in fact, Henry Clinton was so uh, unhappy with having to wait for the, the British brigade to turn up that he actually ordered his other two brigades, uh, which was a KGL brigade and a Hanoverian brigade, uh, to con start the march to Enghien, which is what they've been ordered to do. Um, and in fact, as I said, they left an hour earlier um, and it was only at Enghien, which was about five o'clock, that the, uh, the British Brigade actually managed to catch up with the rest of the division. Uh, so they'd had a pretty much of a rush of it to, to catch up, obviously speed marching to do so. They then had to, they, as soon as they had got there, Henry, division, uh, Henry Clinton had actually got his, another message to say, march to Brain le Comte. Brain le Comte is here, across country, there's no major roads as well. So he actually ordered them after a quick 30 minute break to continue marching. Uh, they arrived at Brain le Comte at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, and some, some didn't even arrive till midnight. So you're actually talking quite a lot of time since they got up at five o'clock in the morning and virtually once it got underway, marching all day long in quite heavy, hot weather this, at this time, until we get into the evening when it starts obviously chucking it down with rain, which is the famous sort of uh, night of rain that we get on the night of the 16th into the 17th, etc. cetera. Um, now, having got there, uh, he already has another order to continue marching to Nivelle, which is getting closer to his, obviously the battle site of Catra Bra. He gives them three hours rest uh, and it, it tried to get a little bit of food, etc. if they had any to, because they certainly had no um, commissariat with them to actually supply them with food. So they tried to buy food, etc. at Brain Le Comte. They then continued marching all the way through the morning and arrived early morning, that is, and arrived at seven o'clock in the morning at Nivelle, uh, thinking that's it, we actually finally got somewhere. I'm sure that's the end of our marching. Only to find out within two hours, they'd been ordered First of all, to march to Catra Bra, 
because Wellington still thought he might be after the, even though he'd had the battle the, fall, the previous day, he was actually thinking he might be able to hold Ney's troops there again. Uh, didn't know what had happened to the, the Prussians at this stage at, at the Battle of Lindy over here. So they're ordered to, to start marching down this road. They start at eight o'clock and the KGL brigade are the first to go off. They actually get about a third of the way along and Clinton gets another order to say, no, go back and then take the road, this major road here, up towards Mont saint jean which is, of course, the site of the Battle of Waterloo. So they then are ordered to march this way. They are ordered to march at 10 o'clock. They don't actually do so. They actually march a few hours later because Nivelle at this stage was full of uh, wagons, full of actual uh, every supply you can imagine. So all of those supplies had to be ordered to go back first. And also, this was the Dutch hospital station for those wounded at Quatre Bras. So they all had to be put on wagons, sent up the road as well. And then uh, Clinton's uh, division moved behind them, covering them as they went up this road. Now, we all know that on the uh, 17th of June, uh, sorry, after the, after the battles of Quatre Bras and Ligny over here, uh, the Prussians had retired towards Wavre, knowing that Wellington was going to stand at Mont Saint-Jean. Uh, and they were using these roads here. This is the main British retreat on this road here. So it's generally thought that the Nivelles Road was a quiet road and nothing happened there. In fact, it's not true. Uh, um, quite a large number of the French cavalry swung over this way in an attempt to, to actually go round the flank of the British retreat. Uh, they found obviously Clinton's division there, uh, which managed to stop them going too far. However, it is recorded that over 100 wagons were captured of both wounded soldiers and some of the supply wagons were captured. So they were actually successful in, in disorganizing, should we say, this retreat. But it ends up that uh, they end up getting to the position at Waterloo at four o'clock that afternoon. So in fact, uh, there are obviously a famous retreats, sorry, a famous marches by the uh, light division in Spain uh, for around about 50 odd miles in 24 hours uh, for uh, in their attempt to try and get to the Battle of Talavera on time, which they don't. Uh, funny enough, this one is virtually the same distance. It's about 52 miles and they actually had to do it in 26 hours, which is quite a lot of marching. Uh, but so that was their campaign up until the Battle of Waterloo. Now, when we, before we get into the actual Battle of Waterloo itself, I want to mention a couple of things that came out of the research as well. Now, this is an average page of uh, just the actual name of each of the soldiers in alphabetical order. Uh, the W after it indicates a Waterloo man, so they will get a medal when it comes through, and obviously their pay, et cetera. Now, on the left, you will actually see numbers, like number seven here for, this is, uh, so look at this one. You've got a Henry Henry Holland here, number nine. Okay, so that nine indicates the company he belongs to, and for the last two centuries, include everybody, including me, has understood that meant he was in nine company, and therefore we could then work out who the officer was that commanded that company and who he actually served under. But it's not as simple as that. We've just discovered. Let me go into it in very brief detail. If you look at the left-hand column, this is actually uh, from that muster list at the back, the officers commanding those companies. And there they have, so number nine would mean that, that Henry Holland was in James Love's company, if you read that, and that's how it's gone for the last 200 years. But we have a few problems. The first thing is the three chaps in black weren't actually serving with the regiment at the time. So, okay, they would have a, a lieutenant who could actually step up or another captain possibly that wasn't available. So that's one way of getting around it. Then you've also got, uh, because everyone assumes that the companies are set up by seniority. And yes, Patrick Campbell was the most senior man in the regiment. And you can see some of them tie in quite nicely, but others don't. And we've even got a Kenneth Snodgrass here who doesn't agree, doesn't appear on this side at all. Uh, so it's all a little bit confusing, which gets even more confusing when you look at the Waterloo Medal Roll, which actually has 
the officers in a different order because suddenly George Young is in ninth position instead of where he was elsewhere at number 10. And then in the, say in the prize money role that came out later, he's in a different order again. So if you look at George Young, he's in three different places out of the four. Uh, and this is where it gets confusing because you think you've, you've got the, the company from what's underneath, so from what's sort of in that first book, but it's, it's not correct. And in fact, if you look at the bottom here, just for a short while, this is the actual regiment in his 10 companies uh, showing Patrick Campbell as number one, according to this list, uh, commanding the Grenadiers on the right. And then uh, if they had Grenadiers, I would say the 52nd didn't have Grenadier and light companies, they were all light. So it's actually, but the senior uh, company would be on the right. And obviously the least senior on the left, which was Langton. But I'm gonna go onto the next screen and show you what was actually the case at Waterloo. If you look at the bottom of the screen now, the actual person that was in charge of number one was actually Diggle. Langton was three. And you've got Shedden at 10, completely different order to actually what we've thought in the past. And every book that's ever been written that I can find in the last 200 years has actually made these mistakes. Uh, and it's fully understood. I've made them for many a year. It's only when I was actually following up this book that I realized what it is. And the reason for it is, is if you actually look at this one here, which is actually the muster rolls, uh, you can see that obviously I've corrected it with who was in charge because I said Campbell was away. So as Dawson's in charge, the other Campbell was away. So Cross is in charge. And further down, you can see who actually took those places. But these are the actual ones next door. So this is the column, which is correct. Uh, I have two questions. I don't know who, who out of Love and Langton did number two and number three. And I don't know out of six and seven who was Ro Rowan and Chalmers. But the others I've got, and the only way I've got them is by the memoirs of the other officers who were in the 52nd at the time. And you're probably now thinking, how the hell, how does, why is it all so, so confused? The reason is when a regiment was set up, whenever that was, of course, the, the most senior officer was given number one uh, company and it went on from there. However, when people changed, and there were people changing from the regiments officer-wise constantly, uh, they were constantly either uh, moving regiments because they wanted a promotion or uh, they didn't want to go to the West Indies and therefore they transferred or whatever. And all of these things happened. And rather than the officers constantly having to change and all the soldiers and having to move into different companies because uh, the, the seniority had changed, that didn't happen. The army did the obvious thing, which is if Dawson left, then Diggle arrived and he would actually take over the company and he would take over that company as number one company. The soldiers would stay in number one company. So the order in which they're there in seniority completely breaks down, but it doesn't matter. So it isn't the case that the most senior officer gets the right-hand company, but it is seen as the most senior company otherwise. Uh, I know it can be a bit confusing and perhaps I've gone into it a bit more detail in the book or I can answer questions on it later. But as I said, you can only work out basically who commanded which company by going through the memoirs and they saying to you, such and such commanded number one company or I was in number three company commanding it, or whatever. And therefore of all the junior officers, these are the only junior officers out of about possibly 30 odd junior officers that I can find who I can definitely tell you were in these companies. This has an effect completely on the rest of the story. And that's why I'm gonna say, that's why I've mentioned it. But as I say, I apologize this is brief because we you don't wanna be here all night listening to me on this subject. It is quite complicated, but it does mean that where we've looked at the different companies and where we thought they were in the battle was completely wrong. And that's why, that's what changes the story. Now, I wanna go back to how good were the 52nd. And I've mentioned that um, Henry Clinton was actually looking after the division. Well, 
previous to looking after their division, he had been sent to Holland in 1814 when there were troops still out there. Um, before, obviously, during the peace period between the end of the war in 1814 and the new campaign in 1815. And he was inspecting officer uh, for the Prince of Orange. So he went round and actually checked out all the regiments. And he was not the easiest officer to get on with, if I can say, put it that bluntly. He was a bit of a martinet. He was really, uh, he was hated, if I'm honest, regarding his uh, sort of, his, his, inspections nothing was ever good enough for him but i think the one thing i'll just point i don't want you to read this whole thing but in fact what i wanted to point out was the the black piece here which he pointed out uh, this is about two months before waterloo that there are nine captains there was hardly an officer who would account for any deficiency in their company uh, but they are so used to being applauded that anything like inquiry excites only surprise or even displeasure now this is actually a bit of a, a clue to something I'm going to go on about is the 52nd is clearly, and like an, an, a few other regiments as well, had made a name for themselves in the peninsula. But there seems to be an attitude that nobody else could tell them that they weren't good enough, that there was something wrong with what they had. There, there was almost, uh, it got to the stage where they were, uh, were unwilling to listen to criticism of any form. Uh, and I think this will come out in some of it as we go forward. The main thing he did say, however, is this. This is the same report. Altogether, this regiment, lately the pattern of the English army, has now more the appearance of the remains of a good system than the present possession of it. Quite a statement, actually. And that went up to high command. So you can imagine, 52nd probably weren't particularly happy to get this report. Um, but it did, certainly it got them, uh, should we say, on the road to actually correcting things. Now, bear with me a second, because for some reason my screen has decided to not let me back in. Oh, there we are. Right. Now, I'm only going to briefly look at this. We have, for the 52nd at Waterloo, quite a lot of actual witnesses. Managed to get pictures of all of them, which I'm actually amazed at. Uh, we know about Colborne. Uh, Major Charles Rowan, obviously, uh, who was in charge when he wasn't, wasn't around. Patrick Campbell wrote to Cyborn. Gawler wrote his, own, uh, his account uh, afterwards. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but he's actually, he is a relative, a distant relative of Colborne, as per William Leake that follows on from him, and Ensign William Young. It, it, there was a, quite a bit of a... Uh, officers from the from distant family, should we say, uh, appearing in the ranks. Uh, Young wrote a re, uh, some me short memoirs. Leek clearly wrote his uh, in incredibly long account, um, which was published in the 1860s, so a long time after the, the battle. Uh, and what I will say is, is, is generally his actual memoirs are pretty accurate on most things. He, he does get it wrong occasionally. Um, and I've been able to show where that is. Um, but I would say that he had been in the army two weeks, literally in Belgium, two weeks, was given an, an actual uh, colour to carry in the battle and was probably spent most of the battle, I would believe, being prodded by his colour sergeant, uh, go left here, sir, go left here, or whatever, step forward here, sir, whatever, um, and was probably worried about maintaining the sort of order of the, the, the actual regiment more than anything else. However, he describes his position as being, I had nothing to do all day. I basically, I was able to stand at the colours and I saw everything perfectly. And I, I, I have to say, uh, from, from some of the things he said, I, I have my doubts on that subject, but we'll look into that further. Henry Clinton, I've mentioned, uh, Frederick Adam commanded the brigade. Uh, William Rowan uh, wrote some memoirs. Lieutenant Hart wrote some letters, but the one that is really something that has made a big difference to the history I've produced of the 52nd at Waterloo comes from this, child, this chap here, Charles Holman, because he is the only account written at the time. And he'd never been published until I published him two years ago in a sister book uh, with all of the actual Waterloo memoirs. Uh, together for the first time uh, of all these 52nd men. But his is the only account written at the time. 
and therefore has real significance because, of course, he is writing within a day or so of the action. And what he says and the times he gives can be certainly a lot more trusted than people writing up to 45 years after the actual action. Now, I'm only going to show you these briefly. This is Mawson's uh, accounts of the battle. Uh, you've obviously got the Allied line here with Hougamont. And this is actually showing the cavalry charges and the four brigade, uh, four uh, squares of the, the uh, brigade, Adams Brigade, out on the forward ridge. Now, I'll talk about that more later. But the main one is obviously uh, his version of how the attack of the guards is defeated. And as you can see here, it shows the 52nd alone, the rest of the, the brigade are still here, turning, flanking a column of 10,000 guardsmen. Now, there's lots of problems with that, which we'll talk about in a little while, but certainly the French didn't even have 10,000 guardsmen to attack with. Uh, so therefore, certainly the numbers are incorrect. Uh, but we'll look at this further because you will notice as well, the guards and everybody else are not to be seen either. So you'll notice it is purely the 52nd in this or completely on their own. And then in the third slide, uh, we've actually um, got the situation towards the end of the battle with the 52nd actually uh, going towards the road and moving on their own. What you will also see, though, is the uh, to, to their right, the 71st and 95th way away from them in the distance, uh, which is saying again that the 52nd did it all on their own, um, which, well, let's, let's see, we'll find out about that in a minute. Another account I'll just show you is Cyborn trying to explain a little bit more this guard column going up with Maitland's men in front of the guard and Adam's brigade coming in from the flank, which has probably become the accepted method of the, the defeat of the Imperial Guard uh, for quite a long time, until quite recently. Uh, and obviously now we're now starting to question this in lots of different ways. So let me talk about their action at the Battle of Waterloo. This is actually the situation from about 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, and you will see the entire uh, division settled back quite a way back. This is actually Merbrain at the back here, the village Merbrain. Uh, so they're set back a thousand yards or so behind the front, KGL in the front, Adams Brigade in the middle, and the Halkett's um, Hanoverians behind them, plus the actual, obviously, the divisional guns. They sat in this position till about four o'clock, uh, took the odd casualty um, there are comments about sort of cannonballs uh, reaching them occasionally over the crest of the ridge, etc. But generally, out of the fighting, not doing an awful lot at all, just waiting for their opportunity, should we say. And that's, that comes at four o'clock, uh, when approximately four o'clock anyway, we've got the situation where we know the French cavalry charges start attacking this part of the line. Now, Wellington orders the troops forward, uh, particularly Adams Brigade. The KGL go forward behind Hougamont, but Adams Brigade move out onto the forward crest. Now, I'm going to show you that on the next screen, because what they do, and they arrive there by about 4.30, so after about 30 minutes into the cavalry attacks, they actually progress onto the forward slope. Uh, so this is uh, Hougamont Orchard. So the 71st were very close to the orchard. First 52nd, because it was a very large um, battalion, actually had two battalion squares, so they, they split it. The second 95th were to their left. And you will notice there are only a couple of companies uh, of the third 95th with the actual brigade. They hung around behind the squares, popping into the squares when they needed to or, and coming out to harass the, the, so the cavalry when they could. Um, this is actually very similar to what you saw on the, on the previous diagram, except that the third, first foot guards were also sent out there, which tends to be uh, ignored. What did these actually do? Well, these clearly formed breakwaters through which the cavalry had to filter. Being fired at on both sides, 
uh, some of them tried to attack the squares, but most of it tried to filter through to get up onto the actual main ridge here. Clearly, that's not easy to do if you've already been disrupted by the squares. This has actually clearly been ordered by Wellington as a, a method of actually breaking up these large formations. So when, when you get all these great paintings of the French charges uh, in you know vast, wide, uh, sort of thousand yards sort of uh, lines, etc. Uh, that could only have happened in the first half hour of the actual battle. After the squares were put into this position, they had to filter through this and it was a completely disorganized situation after that, milling about the squares all over the place here. Nothing more than that. But it's an interesting one where people tend to actually um, forget this part of what the 52nd did. It gets forgotten because everything's about the guards later. But this is just as important as far as I'm concerned. Now, the one thing I will say about this is the second, the 52nd was sat in a bit of a hollow in the middle here, which is quite nice because although the French guns could see these squares on the on the uh, front slope here, the 52nd squares were not under major uh, attack at any stage at this moment in time. They were able uh, to sort of avoid any of the, the cannonballs striking them. However, the 71st and the 2nd 95th had a huge problem with them actually um, constantly taking artillery fire. Uh, but when Wellington actually sees some of this and actually sends a message to Colborne, because uh, Adam is somewhere else at this moment in time, we don't know where he was, but Colborne is, is gets a message, do you wish to retire behind the, the, uh, the crest of the ridge again because you're taking fire? Uh, Colborne quite nicely says, no, we're okay. We're, we're actually not taking too much fire. Well, actually, I think the 2nd, 95th and the 71st would probably disagree with him. Um, but at the same time, the 3rd, 1st foot guards, um, they were actually also taking quite a heavy fire as well. So there were quite some large losses by some of these other battalions. But they then eventually, around about six o'clock, just before six o'clock, retire back into line behind the actual ridge. Um, because the cavalry attacks have largely come to an end and they can reform uh, at the top here into line uh, behind the ridge uh, and await for the next section of the battle. Now, we're going to move on to the guards' attack. Now, all of the evidence, and clearly I can't go through it all on here now, but um, if you do bother to read my book, etc., cetera, um, you will find a mass of evidence from both the French and all of the different British brigades uh, along this line as to the pretty well, I, it's getting to a stage now where it's pretty well accepted that this is how the French guard attacked. You will have some still arguing that, but I think most people now accept it. What happened is, first of all, is that um, the chasseurs, <clears throat> the third and fourth chasseurs, now there is some question as whether the fourth chasseurs formed one square, because there's one witness that actually states they formed one square because the loss is at the Battle of Ligny. Um, but that actually um, doesn't really hold a lot of water because the, Battalion, sorry, that battalion only lost about 200 men, not enough to really cause it to actually have to sort of go into one square because it would have been one little huge square against the other smaller ones. Otherwise, it would have been out of shape. So it's, it's most likely they stayed as four squares. This attack came up the ridge towards the position where the guards were. Now, before we go any further, I do need to mention this plateau area here. Now, this is actually now where the Lion Mound is sat, okay? Now, the Lion Mound was not placed there because that's where the Prince of Orange was actually wounded, as is often stated, because he was wounded somewhere over here. Uh, in fact, it just happens to be the perfect point on which is a nice flat area to actually build a large item like that. So that's exactly why they used it. But the point of this is that that plateau area and you can see the contours coming away from it in fact the land all the way if i take a line down there 
is like a ridge there. And the, and the French actually described this as two valleys, the valley of La Hisson over here and the valley of Hougoumont with this crest or ridge line all the way across the battlefield here. Now, if you actually stand on the battlefield there, you can't see anything here at all. That ridge completely obliterates the other side. So this ridge line obliterates everything to the right and left. You cannot see it because the land falls away quite sharply. Uh, so when this goes in, all of these troops over here can't see anything of this. They have no idea about this guard attack as well. So when they talk about the first guard attack, they're talking about a second one, which will come along later. Now, this first guard attack uh, arrives, we'll say, with the four uh, battalions coming up towards the ridge. The idea clearly was, that as they arrived near the ridge crest, they would actually <clears throat> come out of there, and I believe it's squares. At the end of the day, um, they're either solid battalions in sort of a column, or they're actually in squares. I will explain with a different part of this talk now as to why I believe they were in hollow squares. One, because of Daylon's attack earlier, having been caught with cavalry attacking him at this stage. But the other reason I'll come up to when we talk about the 52nd. All I'm going to say about this now is that they were intending to actually, uh, each battalion coming up would then sort of set themselves out alongside each other and then form line to firefight with the actual British infantry on the other side. Now, that was the intention. Clearly, that didn't happen because as they arrived towards the ridge, uh, Maitland's troops fire quite a devastating couple of rounds and then charge as the, uh, with the bayonet, as the British infantry were li likely to do, and drove them away. Now, as they get driven away, a second smaller column of just two units have actually started moving up this side of the battlefield, which clearly is not visible to these here. It's coming up later because even Napoleon and most of his generals admit uh, this attack was ill-coordinated. They should have all gone at the same time. They went at different times. And as you can see, there are other units which are actually still <clears throat> in reserve that could be used. So let's move on to the second one. Now, before I go, sorry, I would mention one thing. In this, you will probably notice, and you probably wonder why, normally you'd have, in a, in a sort of attack, you would have the most senior units first, and you would have the, uh, so therefore, you know, you, you would expect the grenadiers to be first, then the chasseurs, in this case, who are the juniors, to come second. There is a reason why this happened and why, for example, the fourth lead the, set, the third, for example, which is different to how other people have portrayed it in the past. And this is actually General Petit, who actually says, and he should know because he was in the guard, that in fact, the guard marched from the left of the head, as in the junior ranks to the, to the, to the uh, front, uh, meaning the chasseurs led the grenadiers. Okay, so that's why. I've actually shown it in that form, in, which is the opposite way around to how it's been shown elsewhere. Let me just go down to the thing. Right, now <clears throat> I've said about the first attack and the second attack moving up. So let's, once that first attack has been driven away, Maitland's troops describe charging down the hill and actually driving the chasseurs away. Now, the second attack, which I need to mention quickly, is two battalions of grenadiers actually arrive on the ridge in this area here, which is near Halcott, which I believe is the, so the 30th and 33rd, etc., get involved in uh, this fight. Crews uh, and other Area, other uh, brigades here all get involved but are actually pushed back this is the time when the um sort of dutch are sort of ordered forward to try and hold the line uh by the prince of orange and he gets wounded 
that doesn't work clearly once he's get wounded particularly as well they lose heart and they, and all of this area is starting to fall back uh the brunswickers uh crews etc halkett even the british in the halkett brigade are ad, ad, admit, admit to some extent that they started falling back however uh <clears throat> You can say luck or judgment, because at the end of the day, Wellington had ordered previously the Dutch that had been out at Brain La Lude all day uh, on the far right wing of the army to actually march to very, this very point. And just as these guards the battalions arrive here and start pushing through and driving all these units back, they actually arrive. First of all, the six battalions of Detmer's group and also Kramer's uh, artillery, which finds a position near Halkett's brigade and starts firing into their flank. Dorbrem is the other brigade, arrives a bit later, and in fact, everything is over by the time they arrive. But Detmer's troops, and there are famous paintings uh, of, from the Dutch showing them actually having defeated part of the Imperial Guard. And I cannot find any evidence to actually say they're not right. Uh, I do believe they are right in actually driving this group of grenadiers back. There was another grenadier uh, unit moving up, a more senior one, but by the time he got there, these had been defeated and driven back towards uh, La Haison Orchard. Now, when we get to the guards, <clears throat> the British guards come down the hill and a number of them admit that then a sec another column of guard units uh, appears, which makes them actually turn around and go back up and reform at the top of the crest. I believe it's these, well, it has to be, in fact, if there is a column at all, is these reserve battalions that were sat back here, which includes Cambron in these three, three units. Now, the French vary. Some of them say this was another attack to drive through the centre. Others say it was purely moving forward to actually cover the retreat of these chasseurs. Either way, it would have looked like an advance as it drove the guards back to Adam's brigade. And don't forget, all the time, they cannot see this lot over here at all. No idea what's going on. Adam's brigade, as we know, then moves forward and does what we would class as a 90 degree turn onto the actual flank. Sorry, I'll just, I'll just go past that and I'll explain that in a minute. Flank of the uh, column and engage them on their flank. Now, <clears throat> you will have noticed in the other ones that first of all, there's the question about who orders this movement forward. Uh, and there's also lots of questions about who was in the area. Now, I can actually establish that at the time this happened, uh, Wellington was near the second 95th. Adam was close to the 52nd. Clinton was in the area with the KGL. And all of them saw what happened, saw Maitland's, sorry, the 52nd's movement towards the uh, flank of this column and ordered all available units from Clinton's division that were available here to actually support it fully. Now, the 2nd 95th, who actually uh, were on the inside of the wheels, if you want to call it that, as a wheel to the, to the right, actually were able to keep up with the 52nd pretty well. The 71st had a bit of a bit more of a, a, a march round and we're a bit slow in the third 95th. Um, I said the KGL were involved with looking after Hougamont Orchard and helping the guards, the, the guards in Hougamont Orchard to, con to continue to hold it. They were not ordered to move, but the Hanoverians, which were actually this area, were ordered to move. The Osnabrück unit moved and started marching after them. The other units were meant to come but unfortunately, the messenger, which is one of uh, Clinton's uh, officers, was actually shot and killed, and the messages didn't get through. 
So therefore, only the Osnabrück has turned to, 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 uh, to help. But clearly at this stage, it's not just a 52nd alone. He's certainly got the second 95th with it, and he would have the 71st coming up quite quickly on its right. At this stage, the guards actually see them coming, the, the French guards. Uh, the guards apparently stop, and it's described as the left flank of the squares of the guards turns to face the 52nd and fire quite a devastating volley. Leek reckons 150 men went down. Uh, I'm not sure they all went down to this stage because that's not far off the full casualties for the, the entire battle. Uh, but certainly it was quite a ferocious fire. Now, what I would say to you is if these units were in a different formation where the actual ranks were one behind each other, the different, uh, uh, sorry, and they were ordered for the left flank only to turn, I'm not sure that order would have made any sense. Whereas if you've got four facings of a square and you say to the left flanking flank of that square to turn out and face the enemy that's coming at you, it is very easy to do. And that's why I believe the square makes a lot more sense. Hollow square makes more sense with that face being able to turn independently on uh, to actually face the, the oncoming attack while the rest are, are still in that square formation. That's how it's described by virtually every certain person, single person that was actually involved in this. The 52nd don't fire really. Um, there, is a, there is a short amount of fire from the, the first two companies on the uh, left as they're the first into position. But as soon as Colborne has his uh, regiment in line, he orders to the charge basically with the bayonet. The second 95th would go with him, and obviously the rest uh, follow up as fast as they can. This breaks the actual guard and actually forces them to flee uh, both uh, towards La Belle Alliance and also across the battlefield. Now, at this stage, you might say, particularly as that crest is there, that crest line is there, and Colborne can't see anything beyond it, you have to wonder whether... Uh, he, why Colborne didn't follow the majority of them in that direction. Because what he did is sweep across literally like this, keeping the same line as he's on now, and cross the road over here, just to the south of La Belle Alliance. This happened because this would clear any other troops. And there were other troops because some of the um, line regiments were trying to support these guard attacks and sort of disrupt what was going on and uh, so by doing so, he was sweeping the front of this area to actually ensure that there were no other French units in his rear as he went away. Uh, Detmer had also already pushed these other guard units over this way, but obviously that's something they couldn't see. Now, I said that they went forward in four deep line. That's what they had formed on the crest just beforehand. Now, we don't know which way they formed because Leek and Gawler wrote that the right wing, of, of four, which is the five right-hand column uh, companies, actually were in front in their two deep line, and the left wing, the left uh, five co companies, were in double line behind them, forming your four, uh, four actual sort of lines in going forward. Uh, this was done partly because there was obviously always the danger of cavalry on uh, again. So this would give a little bit more solidity to the actual unit. However, Colborne and Rowan, who actually were more senior, say that's not what happened. What we double did is doubled up each of the companies into fours rather than, you know, so half, half a company behind the other half a company in, in their double lines, making the four lines that way. So we maintained the same order of one to 10. We'll discuss later on who was actually right as far as I think. Now, as I've said, Detmer has chased the guard into the sort of orchard of La Haye Sant, and he gets involved with that. When 
the 52nd come across towards the road, they actually record seeing French troops in this area. And that's another reason why it is believed that these are actually the remnants of those guard units trying to actually reform in this orchard area. And they, but they, they continue to advance. Now, as I said, rather than advancing straight down here towards La Belle Alliance, they actually cross the main road. All of this, is the, all of this uh, brigade, the 71st by now has caught up. So in fact, they all cross the road and then go up in line, form this side, down this way towards the Belle Alliance on this side of the Shores A. This leaves this area open and it is perfectly open for both Vivian's and Vandeleur's uh, brigades of cavalry, which then sweep across the actual um, battlefield and attack the French units here. Uh, some of them are still in square and some of the, the cavalry do get into a bit of a problem with some of the cavalry they sort of encounter, uh, which, which, which retain, uh, re remain firm as squares. The Osnabrookers don't follow this lot over. They've actually managed, they manage to catch up and in fact go ahead and they carry on on the direct road towards La Belle Alliance. And we'll see a little bit more now of what happens there. As they arrive at La Belle Alliance, and as you can probably see at the top of the screen here, you've actually got uh, Vivian's cavalry and Hal uh, this Halkett is the Osnabrookers, okay, passing this side of the road, and you've got the division on the other side of the road. Now, sorry, the brigade on the other side of the road. As they're on this side of the road, they actually, first of all, pass the abandoned French guns uh, on the ridge line, uh, which partly uh, helps confirm that the story that the French artillery during that Ellen's attack had been on that intermediate ridge halfway across the actual battlefield was incorrect because all the guns were found here. What they then do is pass La Belle Alliance and they then pass this lane here. Now, this is actually forms a crossroads with the main road uh, near about there now, where the red dot is, is where the Wounded Eagle monument is today. As they pass he, this lane here, there were French artillery trying to get to the actual main road to actually escape in this direction. And in fact, they get um, caught by the 52nd, this is a quite a famous painting. Uh, the aspect is incorrect. You can't see uh, Plonsonoir Church as well as that. Uh, and in fact, they're actually going towards Plonsonoir rather than the other way around. Uh, but you can see the 52nd, they managed to actually shoot the horses and stop the actual battery escaping. Uh, another famous incident by the 52nd. This is actually that trackway. So that was the trackway at the top there, just out of distance, is actually the crossroads uh, with the actual uh, road going down to um, Charlwa that way and Brussels that way. So this is actually the road uh, as, it, as it is today. Now, having passed there, driving the guards away, finally, at a roundabout, they, they, they pass Rossom Farm, and just as they get to an area called Maison de Loire, de Loire, which is actually still there today, they actually bivouac in this area here, all right? Now, I find this quite interesting because not, Leek says we arrived there at 9.15, which would actually tie quite well with the timings that, uh, the, for the battle as we understand it. But what I do like is the Holman who actually wrote on the very time said we arrived here at 9.15 as well. Uh, so that's quite in interesting because they then sit here in encampment, the battle as far as they're concerned largely over, um, and are there for a good 30 minutes, and both Holman and Leek both agree to this timing as well, that in fact the Prussians, because this road is the direct road from Plansenois, which actually joins the main shores at Maison de Wattewar. And this is actually the way the main force that would the Prussians had been using at Plonsenwar would have come up. They apparently did not appear 
till, till 9.45. That's 30 minutes after the light division had actually, a light brigade, sorry, light brigade had actually encamped in this area here and other British troops had encamped in this area as well. Now, they're both agreeing and there's absolutely no reason to disbelieve it. But what that says is that the Prussians can't have actually, either can't have taken Plonsonwa as early as they say, or they just about managed to drive the French out of Plonsonwa and then reformed, which is probably quite likely, before they actually made any movement towards the main road and actually only reached the main road half an hour after the Allied forces under Wellington had reached this area. Now, I think that's quite an interesting point, but I just bring that up at this stage. It also means, although other uh, troops came along, uh, Prussian troops arrived in this area, La Belle Alliance, uh, Wellington always said he never met Blucher at La Belle Alliance. And in fact, most of the witnesses seem to, seem to say it was somewhere south of Le Cailu because uh, the light brigade, again, say they saw Wellington go south. They heard some cheering, etc., and they think that's what it was when they met. And Blucher would have come with the group from Plansonois. So it's highly likely that that's what happened and they met further down. Now, I just want to mention a couple of other things beyond the battle. Now, the first thing I was going to say to you is this is casualty returns. Don't try and read the whole thing. It's in the book if you want to read it. Uh, but what's important from this is that, in fact, you can now see the casualty rates by company. What does this help us with? Well, it helps with a couple of things. Uh, recent historians of the 52nd and other historians have tried to say that, uh, that, that a lot of the 52nd casualties were from some guns when they actually marched out and turned onto the flank of the guard attack. Well, if that had happened, the casualty rates on the left flank would be much higher than they are. And that pretty well disproves that. The other thing is, if the left side of the, uh, the left companies, uh, the left wing was behind the right wing, you would expect much higher rates of casualties in the right wing than the left wing, because they're obviously taking all the bullets more often than not than the, the ones behind. Again, it doesn't tend to bear out. The only one that actually is slightly higher is the left hand uh, company of brown rig and that is actually because they were sent out as skirmishers in advance of the the uh, the attack on the guard and they are known to have taken higher casualties uh when they were actually skirmishing with the guard before the main attack went in uh so it generally basically means that it is most likely that in fact this is not correct but this is how it was done. And Colborne, to be fair, and Rowan, who are the senior officers with the actual battalion, should know how it was done. And it was definitely done in this order. Uh, it would make sense with regard to the casualty figures. Now, just show you a couple of uniforms of the period. Uh, this is both Anderson and Hart. Uh, Anderson was a lieutenant at the time. Uh, that is not a bullet hole. That is actually completely moth-eaten. Um, wasn't shot shot through the shoulder there. Um, but just to give you an idea of the uniforms of the time, I then want to talk a couple, very briefly a couple of things on the way to Paris, because there are a couple of things that uh, I would like to talk about on this thing about Clinton was talking about earlier about the 52nd and discipline. Now, if you look at the companies and who fell out on the march to Paris, and I have to say 19 means that about one man a day was dropping out, or two men a day were dropping out on the march to Paris, which is quite high from what I've seen against other, other, other uh, regiments that I've looked at. But Patrick Campbell's was virtually half of it, which means that there was clearly, you'd think, a bit of a problem with Patrick Campbell's company, if you looked at it in this way. Um, Robert Campbell's also wasn't brilliant at 16%, but you can see the others were quite low. However, when you look at other things, because there were desertions on the route as well. Um, in fact, the regiment had 29 desertions during the year, uh, just about three, I think it was, before Waterloo. Um, 
I will mention now, four men actually went missing during the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, all four men turned up a little bit later and were not classed as deserters, so they're not in these figures. Uh, because Colborne, after the battle, decided that rather than punish them for desertion in battle, he would actually insist that they didn't go on the Waterloo list for a medal. And he felt that was a bigger punishment than anything else. I'm not sure the other men perhaps would have felt as exactly the same about that, seeing as these guys had disappeared when the fighting was the hottest type thing. But um, that's what he chose to do instead. Now, if you look at desertions, you can see it's other companies that has the problems with you've got both Love and Langton having the big problem with that. Uh, the, the others are not the same. You know, Campbell in this occasion is much lower. So then, you know, there's no real sort of um, consistency there regarding that. But what I would say is a couple of things. This is, again, is Henry Clinton. Don't read the whole thing. I just want to point out the black thing. Henry Clinton sees them again in July in Paris and says, basically, this regiment shall, if it was employed in assaulting a place or in any service in which its subordination shall be called into question, as in doing a siege or whatever, uh, with the support to support the authority of his officers, all good qualities will be of little accord. There is in this respect a laxity of discipline, which is very disgusting. Now, as I said, Clinton is not the easiest man, uh, but he's clearly not happy still with the actual discipline of the regiment. He goes on further in the same thing to say, the 52nd is seen to great disadvantage under Sir John Colborne. He knows nothing of manoeuvring and seems to hire himself upon gaining no information on it or instruction by means of any superior officer, as in he's not listening to him. Now, seeing as Colborne is lauded for his movement on the battlefield, uh, it's an interesting comment, to say the least. But what I would say is, as I said, Henry Clinton is not the easiest man to get on with, but at the same time, there is a further inspection report by Adam in charge of the brigade. Now, don't read that thing. It's just the start of it, but he goes on about all sorts of different stuff. But right on here, he goes on a bit further. The number of court martials is now up to 90 since his last report is considerable. Now, I have done some work on this with Zach White, who has actually done a huge PhD on um, sort of um, this period and court martials, etc. And I can only tell you that when I told him that the 52nd had 90 in a year, he fell off his chair because basically his his view was that half a dozen was excessive. So we've got a serious issue here. The other thing is that Sir John Colborne governs his regiment with a firm hand, but has an inclination to deviate from established rule and a desire for independence of his superior officers is perhaps one of the causes why a sort of exclusive spirit exists in the battalion. So there's a little bit more comment about both the battalion having this exclusivity, which it doesn't listen to criticism, and that Colborne is, is part of the problem. And right at the bottom, again, following on from what Clinton had said, is Sir John Colborne is not a very expert drill. Now he's talking about manoeuvring here. So we've got a couple of comments that are just questioning some of the things that are said about Colborne normally. Now, I've said the court martials, so I've just, this is the last thing I'm going to look at, and then we'll finish. Um, you'll be glad to hear, I'm sure. But I wanted to show that, in fact, that the regimental court martials by company, and funny enough, Patrick Campbell now hits the top again. Okay, so there is a, there possibly is an issue with Campbell, but what I wanted to do was <clears throat> see if there was any correlation uh, with regard to the officer in command and how the battalion is commanded or uh, how, how the actual punishment regime is and whether that has any difference on the, the discipline of the troops. And the reason I say this is because one of the officers, Shaw, says that 
when Colonel Colborne was in charge of the regiment, he was very much one that didn't believe in corporal punishment and would actually lessen the uh, charges or lessen the punishment uh, by doing solitary confinement on things like this instead or stoppage of beer or whatever um, in an attempt to sort of get the troops to be disciplined but in a different way and he actually said it didn't work um, and that when Colonel Rowan was in charge in in Colborne's absence Rowan initially did the same thing but then later on he learned that if the first couple of people who actually did something terrible were actually given the full lash that they were punished with that they were to be punished with then after that, you didn't get as many uh, actual um, offences being, being sort of caused. Now, clearly, I'm not going to say I'm an advocate for <laughs> returning to the lash in the army, for example, but I'm giving you an example of whether that can be proven in this situation. And what I managed to do is if you look at the bottom box here, you can split the commands because Rowan was in charge until April 1815. There were two offences, only two offences, and those two were actually remitted, as in they were actually not given the full punishment. So, OK, Rowan there has done what even what Shaw was complaining about Colborne was. But Colborne took over in May, and for the rest of that year, there were an incredible 122 major offences. Uh, now... OK, we've had a campaign. I get that. And, you know, there's been all the sort of the marching to Paris and everything else. Understandable. So the numbers have gone up here and I understand that. And you can see 77 percent were actually remitted. Not all were. Uh, so he was clearly uh, in some cases believing it was required. But when you go further to 1818, there is an interesting statement. And this may be where Shaw comes in, because in the first half of the year, Rowan was back in charge. Colborne had gone off on with his wife on a, a, a trip around Europe. Uh, there were seven cases of which he actually remitted two, which is only 30 percent, if you want to round it that. Uh, but when Colborne came back and there's no reason to that for anything different to have happened, they hadn't moved around much. They, they, there was nothing happening uh, regarding the regiment. But in the second half of the year, we see 26 offences of which 22 were remitted, it means an 85% remittance rate, which indicates that perhaps Shaw is, in, is correct in saying that when Rowan actually made sure that the first few people uh, got the full lash, they didn't get as many offences. And when Colborne was around, the numbers of offences rose. Now, I'm going to do some more work on this, but clearly the initial evidence is pointing in that direction to some extent. And that's as far as I like to go on that subject. Now, I've actually obviously picked up a few things and said there were problems with the 52nd, but at the end of the day, I would like to say that they were very much an excellent core overall. They did excellent work in the Waterloo campaign, and I'm not denigrating that in any way. And even Wellington, uh, and I won't go into, I haven't gone into it here, but the, the whole argument about who got the uh, credit for the defeat of the guard, etc. That's something I've dealt with in the book in huge detail. Um, but what I would say is that Wellington, on arrival at Paris, only allowed one brigade to enter Paris with him and guard his headquarters. Now, that was always seen as a huge uh, statement of uh the the abilities and quality of those troops and their prestige uh and normally you'd have expected him in that situation to have actually had guardsmen around him he didn't he had the light brigade and they were actually his his guard in paris for the entire period and i do believe that wellington actually did that in recognition of what they had done in the battle now that is the end of my slideshow um, I will come out of this and hopefully there'll be somebody there to actually uh, talk.
Yes, well, thank you very much for that, uh, Gareth. Um, there, there's been a one or two. If I just start the question, why do you think it was that the account by Holman took so long to come into the public domain? Um, I have to be honest, I, it's one of those things where it's been hidden in plain sight. It's been in a glass cabinet in the Light hmm. Division Museum for years, and the curators wouldn't let anybody at it. <laughs> It's as simple as that. Uh, and when I found out about it, I actually uh, sort of just had to do a lot of pleading and eventually they agreed one day to take it out of their cabinets and actually let me photograph it and then sort of look at it. And then we realized what was there. But unfortunately, that's exactly what happened to it. It just went into a cabinet and there are, I've got lots of things I would love to see in different cabinets in different regiment museums that it seems almost impossible to get at. They don't like taking them out once they're in there. <laughs> okay, right. In terms of the the questions, let's have yeah. a look. Uh, what's happened to? Uh, oh yeah, um, we've had one. First question we've had is that um, this is from Lyndon Robinson. I can't understand why the French would be in a hollow square, facing our chaps in extended line, because one imagines that an extended line can bring more muskets to bear per number of troops. Um, yes, you're quite right. I mean, what what the French were doing was in their approach to the line, bearing in mind that the, your average musket is not dangerous at beyond 100 metres. So when you're crossing the thousand odd metres across the battlefield, you, you have a choice of either crossing in column or in square. Uh, it's unusual in square. It has been done. It, I mean, even the Brits did it at certain battles. Fuentes de Nero, they sort of ma managed to march around in squares. Um, but, you know, alternatives to that were more dangerous, should we say. Delon's attack did something completely different. It's, we won't go into the, the, the complete structure of that now. But basically, uh, he, he formed a column, but a very wide not very deep column, if you imagine, instead of the normal shallow, but uh, sorry, uh, not very wide, but very deep one, which they would normally do. So you have the column, but the whole intention of the column was not actually to get all the way to the British line and break through in column or square. What you would do is you would get, the aim was to get to about a hundred meters away and then halt and form into line. Uh, and then you would get into the firefight with the British. The problem with the French is that, the, uh, for the French, was that Wellington was constantly hiding his troops, as we know they did in this case with the guard behind the crest at this stage, and in fact, most of the regiments behind the crest. So the French never knew where that line was, and that's why their column attacks during me many of the battles throughout the peninsula and everywhere else also had the same problem is they they didn't know when the right time was to stop to form the line but that was actually what they wanted to do form the line at just over 100 meters then advance into that firefight at just under 100 meters firefight between the two sides and that was the intention uh, so the whole question is about the square is only about the the advance is whether they went in in into a columns a solid column or into a square uh, okay. but the whole intention when they got there was to form line okay right and we also have a question from michael rayner uh, it seems that the closest the imperial guard came to achieving a breakthrough was in the right hand attack which pushed uh, halkett's brigade and some of the Br brunswick division back in disarray and were only stopped by the timely arrival of Detmer's brigade and the Netherlands horse artillery. Do you think that's a fair assessment? If it Absolutely. is, then shouldn't these unit's contributions receive more credit than is usually the case? Um, yes, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's, it's a fight that is still going on, should we say, as in between historians, because I've even got Dutch historians that actually say that the, the, these troops had nothing to do with the defeat of the guard. So, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing discussion on both sides of the channel, should we say. Um, the evidence fits from what I can find out from both the French side, and I said I've put this in huge detail in the book, obviously, I can't do it on a talk like this, um, but a lot of evidence from every side indicating why I believe it was uh, guard units that they actually saw there uh, and fought. Um, it makes sense with what the French say and everybody else. 
the I have been championing them for a while, but as I said, we haven't got complete agreement on this with everybody else. Other people think it's part of uh, Don's a lot's ordinary infantry, etc. But I believe uh, no, so certainly um, all the evidence points towards there being guard units in that area. Uh, and and certainly they nearly did break through. Uh, I mean, I didn't show on that plan there because there's, some of them had actually already been pushed back, but there were further troops under Vink, et cetera, that had already been pushed back uh, as beyond Mont Saint-Jean. So, um, you know, that area in the centre there was extremely close to collapse. Uh, and as I said, you can say, it, OK, it's luck that Wellington got his, these Dutch troops there at that right time. Uh, was it luck or was it just right the good judgment but certainly that section of the battlefield was close to collapse wellington knew it was close to collapse uh perhaps didn't know these guards were going to attack there but clearly that they were nearly the final breaking straw of the center of the army mm. i mean although it's not central to obviously the role of the 52nd mm. it, your sort of suggestion towards the end in terms of the bivouac and so on was that maybe um, the Prussians didn't arrive as early as a certain German historian believes. <laughs> uh, well, yes, that's why I find it fascinating, because to be honest, most of the time, um, it's very, it's very confused. Most people's work, well, understandably, you know, most people didn't have uh, access to a, a timepiece at the time. Um, you know, they couldn't exactly remember when the Prussians appeared and everything else. But there is definitely this statement that, you know, from both Leek had said it, but of course, as I said, he was saying it so long before I thought, mm, don't know, I can't, don't know how I believe it. But once I got Holman saying exactly the same timings, uh, written, you know, literally just after the battle, I'm thinking, no, there's got to be something in this. And it just, it, it, it doesn't mean that the Prussians don't have a major part in the battlefield because they, they clearly have taken Plonsonoir. Um, my, best judgment is that having taken Plonsonoir, that the generals thought that before we actually continue to advance, we actually reform because bearing in mind, if you've actually had street fighting driving the, the French through Plonsonoir, you know, you're going to be quite unformed, etc. They, you know, and I think that there was, you know, it would make absolute sense to reorganize yourself before you push on. And I think that's what happened. Um, so I'm not denigrating the Prussians <laughs> completely, if you see me. All I'm saying is the 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 idea that you know they may even have got to the to the main shores before the Brits uh, or before the uh, Wellington's allies um, can't be right, or it doesn't <laughs> appear to be. Okay, well, I, I, I don't. Uh, are there any other questions out there for for Gareth? No, I do think so. So Pat, I will now hand over to Derek. Thank you very much. I'm just going to um, share my screen. I um, hope you can all see that. Uh, Gareth, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. That was uh, that was a fascinating and informative talk. I really enjoyed it and I hope the, uh, the audience did too. Um, on behalf of the Trust, uh, I'd also like to say thanks to Ian Beckett for all his hard work in pulling this together. Um, and uh, last, but by no means least, thank you to you, the audience, because if, if you weren't here, there would be no point really in doing these talks. Um, so thanks very much indeed um, for your participation. Uh, if you enjoyed tonight, um, there's more to come. Uh, we have another talk uh, looking at the Bucks connect connection uh, to Agincourt, and that will be on the 10th of May at, uh, at uh, seven o'clock when Professor Anne Curry will be the speaker. Um, and on the 14th of June, at the same time, um, Dr. Bill Mitchinson will be talking about the role of the 48th South Midlands Division uh, during the First World War. And of course, that's the division that the uh, Bucks Battalion was uh, a part of. Um, I'd also like to just flag up that uh, this year we are seeing the return of our annual Viney Memorial Lecture, um, which has had a gap of two years because of COVID. Um, this year, we're going to be doing it in association with the Buckingham Literary Festival. And Dr. Rob Lyman will be talking about the Forgotten War, and I, by that he means uh, the fighting in Burma during the Second World War. Um, tickets will be going on sale for that, and they'll be available through the festival organizers' website. 
uh, and information on that will also be on the Bucks um, Little Museum Trust website, so you can have a look there for that uh, in the next few days. Um, finally, um, just to say that we, we, we do these talks, they are free, um, but if you'd like to donate, you can, uh, and you can do that via our website, and the details for that are on the screen. Um, you can find out more about what we're up to uh, at the website as well. Um, and you can follow us on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and on Instagram. So again, on behalf of the Trust, Gareth, thank you very much for, uh, for doing that talk for us. It, it was brilliant, as I say, really enjoyed it. Um, and I hope we see uh, some of the audience in a future um, lecture. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>